Dogma, Ronin, Dogma, Ronin. Which should I buy will be the question a lot of people are asking this week, particularly if they've got a PS5 or if they're platform agnostic and they're into big open world RPGs. Two games out on the same day which have a lot of low level similarities and therefore a lot of crossover appeal between them. Dragon's Dogma 2 and Rise of the Ronin are both Western style open world games from acclaimed beloved Japanese studios who generally don't do this sort of thing. The origins of Dragon's Dogma as a series is Capcom looking at games like Oblivion and Fable and asking the question, okay, so what does our version of that look like? And coming up with the answer, something weird and wonderful and obnoxiously unique. Rise of the Ronin is Team Ninja's first stab at this sort of thing and consequently their first stab at something where your chief interaction with the world isn't stabbing. I mean, you do a lot of stabbing, but it's not the only thing you do, which is, you know, new territory for them. But Team Ninja also have an impressive heritage and a glowing CV as long as your arms. So big things are expected of this latest PlayStation exclusive open world action game. I am joined by Alex Donaldson and Sharif Saeed, our reviewers for Dragon's Dogma 2 and Rise of the Ronin, uh, respectively. And at this point, it's not going to last like probably more than 24 hours after this point, but at this point, I'm pretty confident in saying that these guys are the world's foremost authorities on these two specific games because they're not out yet and most people haven't played them. Whereas Alex and Sharif have been playing these games long enough now to have left like permanent dents in a wooden chair. So I'm going to be giving them each five categories on which their chosen subjects are to be judged and a strict one minute time limit per category to make their case. Those categories are characters, world building, combat, art direction, and cat appreciation. Five facets of the modern video game that I feel both games have a pretty good chance at winning in. I'll decide the winner of each segment based on what they tell me in their pitches, and then the winner will be deduced by a simple tally. This is Dragon's Dogma 2 versus Rise of the Ronin. Welcome to RPG Ageddon. It's a hydrogen bomb versus coughing baby uh, <laughs> situation. So let's not beat about the bush. Uh, Alex, you've got one minute to tell me about characters. The characters of Dragon's Dogma 2. Are they memorable? Are they well written? Are they handy in a fight? One minute, please, on the characters of Dragon's Dogma 2. It's got the story characters and it's got more of those, I think, and more recognisable and like funny and interesting ones than the original Dragon's Dogma. So it's like Captain Brandt, who's an Idris Elba sort of looking dude, who's the captain of the guard in the, uh, in the main city. And there's princes and the lady you run to the brothel there's all these great characters but the thing i want to focus on two things the first thing is you can get to know absolutely anyone so you can give people gifts bring them along with you if you want talk to anyone in the game there's lots of cool characters involved with side quests like i discovered an evil nun that was running that was working at a hospital and was uh poisoning her patients and all that sort of stuff <laughs> wow. and then you and then you've got and you could obviously do what you want with her in terms of you can turn her in or help her or turn her in then break into the jail and set her free 15 seconds in addition to that, you've got the pawns, and they are just great characters. Like, you create them, you use pawns from other people, but you get really attached to them. They're fun. What is this? Pawns. There we go, two seconds to spare. Um, and I, I've played, I've been playing, obviously played the original Dragon's Dogma and played Dragon's Dogma 2, and I will agree, the pawns this time around have so much personality, they're great. Okay, Sharif. The characters in uh, this Team Ninja game, it's new territory for Team Ninja. We've talked about this on other videos in the past. So yes. your minute starts now. I think it's worth celebrating that they exist in this game. Yep. Uh, it, Team Ninja games usually have characters that are almost always, they almost always exist in cutscenes. Like some of them will accompany you, you here and there. Very rarely will you have any interaction with them that isn't speaking, uh, exhausting their two sentences, and then going off to fight every single person that you run across. Uh, this game has a more traditional Western production type of it, where there's downtime, you're going to speak to people, there's in fact a bond mechanic, uh, where you grow your bond with these characters by giving them gifts, and you listen to what they have to say, and then that sort of I don't want to call them royalty missions, but they sort of spawn their quests from that. And then you take them on adventures with you and then they grow. And then also that lets you borrow their combat styles and Two learn seconds. from them. It's good that we have them. It's just not compelling on a narrative sense. 
you uh, you went over the time limit, but I'm going to allow it. Uh, but made a good case there for, uh, you know, I was quite excited by some of the things you were saying there about how there's basically more ways to interact with the world. You're, you're actually able to converse with people. The fact that there's downtime, I love that about action games. I love being able to kind of take a step back and not have to fight everything. So, yep. uh, so that's the characters category. We're going to check the winners now. And I can reveal that there's a shock right in winner, which is Kanan Lynch 2, Dog Days. Uh, few characters are as memorable as the eponymous Kanan Lynch. One is a smart, casual hitman who wouldn't look totally out of place walking into shot in a Tarantino film. And the other is a reimagining of Hulk Hogan as a baldy Rabsy Nesbit analog who keeps a tarantula in the house. And as good as the other games are, there's no NPC quite that memorable. So the next category is world building. Uh, I think, Sharif, do you want to have your minute first? We'll swap, sure. switch it up this time. Okay, yeah. your time on world building in Rise of the Ninja starts. Is it Rise of the Ninja? No. Your time Rise on world building in Rise of the Ronin starts now. Okay, so uh, historical fiction. Uh, very little fiction compared to Neo's, uh, to, compared to Neo and Team Ninja's fast games. Uh, so the game is set at the very end of the Shogunate, which is basically the Japan that we know, that people know from the samurai movies, the the, the, the very closed off isolationist country. Mm. The Western powers are vying for their attention. They're looking to trade with them. And so it's a very interesting era. And so there are within the game voices for and against the shogunate. Some people say like, no, these people are going to poison our culture. They have already brought diseases that we didn't have. They have already done this and that. And other people are, no, we need to open up to modernity with whatever risks that may entail. And so I think it's a very interesting one that also ties into some of the mechanics in the game uh, instead of just making it as a backdrop. I love that. Five seconds to spare as well. Brilliant. That is, again, really interesting. And uh, it, it ties into the sort of the Assassin's Creed element of this where you have got two kind of clashing cultures and you're kind of you as the player are kind of sort of involved in, in, in this conflict that's playing out. I love that. Okay, so world building, uh, Alex. Quite simple, really. This is a game that is completely uncompromising in its world. So if you want to wear a helmet and because you want the RPG stats, but you don't want to see the helmet, tough shit. You've got to wear the helmet if you want the stats. <laughs> if you want to fast what? travel, fast travel teleporting is really rare. Otherwise, everyone would be teleporting everywhere. So you've got to walk places or get on the back of an ox cart and, and, be, and be carried there really slowly by, a, by an ox-drawn carriage. Like, the world is not compromised for gameplay at any point. This might mean it can be a little bit obtuse and a little bit frustrating to some people, but the beauty of it is the world just feels so joined up in a way that play, things like even The Witcher or Skyrim or whatever don't it's just it feels real and when you're walking through with all the walking through the wilds with all the AI routines going on and you're fighting some goblins and a griffin flies overhead and you see the shadow of the griffin pass over you and you almost shit yourself because you think it's going to swoop down and kill you that's world building there we go one minute bang on incredible okay right I can't believe this it's Caden Lynch 2 again. Uh, Caden Lynch 2 is set in the real world location of Shanghai, depicted from the perspective of two scumbag street level criminals out. on the run from a powerful gang. It may not be a sprawling open world, but nothing in the other games comes close to its tangibility as a tight, close quarters urban maze, densely packed with the oh. intense realism of neon soaked decline. The intense realism. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a write-in, but it's it's doing the numbers, so uh, that's a bit of a shocker. So let's see if the other two games can have any joy in the next category, which is combat. Alex, your one minute on Dragon's Dogma 2's combat starts now. Listen, this is a game from the team and from the director of Devil May Cry 5 and a lot of the Devil May Cry series. They've got the combat chops. How would I describe this combat? It's sort of like Devil May Cry had a baby with Monster Hunter. It's got sort of the stylish, slick, quick, combo-y sort of combat of Devil May Cry, but it's mingled with the uh, multiplayer, multi-party perspective and tackling the huge beasts of Monster Hunter. And then it's got some classic RPG tropes and stuff mingled in as well. Where And it's a proper full fat RPG. It sort of takes some Dungeons and & Dragons and all that sort of stuff. It's just deep and lovely and it's a great sort of confluence of all this stuff 
And yeah, I mean, look, Devil May Cry team, making an RPG, taking lessons from games like Monster Hunter, I think that says it all. You start off with like, these are the guys behind fucking Devil May Cry and Monster Hunter. So <laughs> Team Ninja's got a lot to do to catch up to that. But Team Ninja have their own level of, uh, of pedigree that works for them well here. So Sharif, your minute for Rise of the Ronin starts now. Yes, so as you mentioned, Team Ninja's combat is maybe just as uh, compelling, just in a completely different way. And so what I think is interesting about the combat in this game is that it is the most accessible combat that Team Ninja has ever done. Uh, it is built on the bones of Neo, the Neo games, uh, but it is streamlined in so many ways. For example, there's a difficulty setting. Uh, in fact, the lowest option uh, on that list unlocks even more assists for players who want to look cool and don't want to bother with a lot of the uh, a lot of the difficulty that comes with that. But also, the combat itself is very. I don't want to say it's it's drip fit, but a lot of the complexity is paced in such a way that does not scare off or should not scare off new players. Uh, I think if you looked at the new game and said you wanted to play that, but were terrified of it, this would be a good entry point to understanding why people like those. Interesting that this is the sort of one you'd, you'd think that the Team Ninja game would be the one that's really uncompromising in its difficulty, but I feel like <sighs> Dragon's Dogma 2 doesn't have any difficulty options, so I no. feel like it's weird that that's the one that's like, you know what, you're going to take what we fucking give you and you're going to like it. And Team Ninja are a bit like, mm, we want people to actually like this one, so, uh, <laughs> so we're going <laughs> to cut you a bit of slack. But let's see who has won. I actually, I can't believe this. This is, Kane and Lynch 2 are going for a clean sweep here. Kane and Lynch 2 is a third person shooter with guns and therefore infinitely more satisfying than any of the swords or magic bollocks offered by the other games. I can't, that's what it says. Uh, it's Rise absolute. of the Ronin has guns. That's why it's like the, the era it's in, they're very early firearms. It doesn't have Uzis or anything, does it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Next category is uh, art direction, which is, I mean, this could go anywhere, frankly. Sharif, uh, would you like to give me one minute on the art direction of Rise of the Ronin starting now? Uh, I've always been a fan uh, of the look and the art direction of the Neo games. They do so much with so little. This time, they have sort of done the upgrades that a lot of studios uh, went through from the PS3 generation to the PS4 generation, which is upgrade their tech to support open world, upgrade it to support really beautiful character faces, really beautiful animations. And so the art direction is actually not the star of the game, not the star of the show this time, because it's very much grounded and realistic. There's not a lot of fantasy there, but it's the accomplishment of having that engine simply bringing them into the future in a way their past games were made them limited really bodes well not just for this game but for the future of Team Ninja's game because they have sort of made the leap that a lot of other studios uh, made like a generation ago uh, so even though it's not it may not be interesting on its own uh, on the whole it's really good that we have it the way it is lovely okay Alex one minute on Dragon's Dogma 2's art direction uh, which I feel is actually a way more difficult one to describe than uh, than Rise of the Ronin, so your minute starts now. I just can't believe that this is an RE engine game. This is an engine that was designed for bloody tight corridors and darkness and all that sort of stuff. And yet this game just has beautiful vistas. And I think that's where you zero in on this game is that when you're approaching certain cities and sort of you see or you round a corner and you see a city sprawling out in front of you and it just looks gorgeous and unlike a lot of games there's no fakery all those buildings are really there a lot of them you can get right up to and get close to and it's just lovely in addition some great character models um i always feel like probably a hangar for resident evil character models in the re engine tend to look a bit sickly but in this game everyone looks great but you know it's got a strong medieval style as well like European medieval style, takes itself quite seriously, quite down to earth. And I just think it looks great. And let us not forget, it's got some incredible monster designs, some of which are from the first game, but there's quite a lot of new ones as well and quite a lot of adjusted ones. And all this stuff combines to be really good. And one last note, some really good black character skin and faces and hair, which isn't that common in Japanese games. Brilliant. You went slightly over, but you were making a really good point at the end, so <laughs> I wasn't going to cut you off. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, I agree. The character faces are incredible in Dragon's Dogma and Dogma 2. 
Captain Brant, the Idris lookalike a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. It's great. That, that face is incredible. It's a beautiful game. Uh, and Ronin's a beautiful game as well, but uh, we're going to have to see who fares best. And I actually... I'm actually astonished by this because the one thing people know about Kane and Lynch 2 is that it looks like ass, but it's looking like a clean sweep for Kane and Lynch 2. Uh, art direction, Kane and Lynch 2's signature feature is its dogmatic devotion to its almost headache-inducing visual style, which is painstakingly designed to evoke the look of a mid-2000s digital handicam and entirely succeeds, which is why it's frankly disgusting to look at. But as a byproduct of this, the game runs at a locked 60 frames a second, which <laughs> in turn helps the shooting feel snappy and satisfying in a way that kicks the shit out of whatever's going on with Dragon's Dogma and its unlocked frame rate that sees the number 30 as more of a guideline than a rule. I can't stick the boot into Rise of the Ronin on that one because I've not played it. You may be excited to know that it does not run especially well on any of its modes. <laughs> there are three of them and they are all compromised. It's a clean sweep, <laughs> it's a clean sweep. Right, okay. Lastly, the very last one, and I think Kane Lynch 2 is oh, gonna man. do really badly here. So uh, this is the category that Sharif uh, requested <laughs> that we put in because it's a shoe in for Rise of the Ronin. Uh, but let's let's see how we do. Uh, cat appreciation, uh, appreciation of our feline friends. There's one right behind me, right there. Uh, now, you know, being able to pet the cat in games is a, is a very highly requested feature. You can do it in Assassin's Creed. You can do it in lots of things. Can you do it in either of the games we're talking about today? Cat appreciation in Dragon's Dogma 2. Can you give us one minute on that starting now? Well, I don't know why Sharif's kind of requested this for Rise of the Ronin to win, because Dragon's Dogma 2 is a game where it has an entire race of beastmen who are all felines. Uh, <laughs> so you've got, you know, the empress of, a, of, of one of the most important nations in the world is a cat lady. And you can create a cat person and you can your pawn can be a cat person. You can hire... And, you know, you can use the game's bond mechanics to get to know if there's a villager that you particularly like who happens to be a cat person. You can start giving them gifts, flowers, rings, valuables to get your affection rate up with them to make them someone who wants to follow you around and sort of worship you. So in that sense, you can sort of pet the cat, yeah. It's a, it's a game where cats aren't just cute pets, but the cat people are on an equal footing with the humans. There's not very much of the weird, crappy... Uh, fantasy racism trope. Uh, there's a little bit, but they sort of keep that to a minimum. It's a world where all these people get on. And yeah, there's a whole race of cat people. 50% of the world is cat. I mean, that's uh, that's exactly. pretty solid. You're going to have to like come up with something pretty special to uh, argue against that, Sharif. Think uh, got you've got Think one got minute to do so starting now. As you mentioned earlier, most games, they go for the low-hanging fruit. They let you pet the cat. Yeah. Why is this Ronin? It goes above and beyond. Not only can you pet the cats, an entire one of the collectibles in the game is cats. And not just cats. There are normal cats and there are calicos. And what's the difference, you may ask? Well, calicos are easily spooked. And when you're rounding a corner, thinking that there's a cat around there that you want to collect so that you can finish off that region and complete it, you don't know what kind of cat it is. So you have to be on your toes to get the opportunity to pet the cat. And later on, you meet someone who runs a cat concierge business <laughs> to send cats to people who are willing to pay money for it. But that's not all. You go to your long house where you manage said business. And then there's an error message that pops up that says, you do not have enough cats when you don't have enough cats to send them out on missions. I don't think there's any game in existence that has the thing that says you do not have enough gaps. Thank you very much. I received the rest of mine. That's that's incredible. Uh, so like it seems like both games respect cats in their own <laughs> unique ways. Dragon's Dogma 2 has given them an entire country to run. Uh, I don't think cats have ever enjoyed that much agency, and I'm frankly terrified by the prospect, knowing what mine is like. Uh, and uh, Rise of the Ronin uh, doesn't try and elevate cats above their position as, as beloved sort of domestic pets, but respects them a great deal anyway. Uh, Kind of, kind of whores them out a little, which I find uh, slightly troubling, Sharif. But okay, uh, it's, uh, well, think of it as a reverse cat sitting, where <laughs> instead of you getting paid or doing it as a favor, you are paying to sit cats, which I think is a solid business. Everyone is happy in this transaction. I know a couple of people who work on the site who I can totally see 
would pay like 20 quid a week just to have a cat sit with them for, uh, you know, for a few Especially hours. Especially since you wouldn't have to take care of them like the other, you know, th- 23 hours Nine or shits in my house. And I, I pay hundreds of pounds for the privilege. Like, she's got better health care than me. She gets more time to sit on the fucking couch than I do. Like, it's, a, it's an actual nightmare. Uh, I'm glad she's joined us today, actually. Uh, okay, so uh, cat appreciation. Now, I I personally think that Sharif is right and that Ronin might have this in the back. Let's see what the, uh, what the card says. It's a fucking clean sweep for Kane and Lynch, too. Uh, Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days has no cats. It doesn't even have any dogs. And to be honest, why would you want a beloved family pet anywhere near such a wretched world as this? You wouldn't, which is why it manages a clean sweep across all categories. So the question has been asked and answered out of uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 and Rise of the Ronin. Which should you buy? Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days, of course. (laughs) 